please welcome President and Chief Executive Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Daniel Lapp. Good afternoon, everybody. A quick change. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure for the seventh year in a row to make this introduction. But before I do that, um, I want to recognize Stephen Polk for a terrific job you've done chairing this uh, <laughs> conference. Dennis Archer, Jr., for your leadership for these two years of the chamber and all that you do in Detroit. Dennis, thank you. And to uh, Sandy, Tammy, Wendy, and the whole crew, I chaired this conference 10 years ago, and to see the depth that goes on today uh, is phenomenal. And every year it continues to get better. So again, a great job uh, by the chamber staff, and thanks for all that you do as well. Uh, what comes to mind in, in this introduction, we all, many of us here are running businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses, and the term um, uh, tone at the top comes to mind. Uh, usually, if you see a well-run business, the leader of that business has terrific tone at the top, and that means a lot of things to a lot of people but it general, generally means things like collaboration, making tough decisions, putting people together. And as I think of the, the uh, almost seven years that uh, Rick Snyder has been uh, governor, he has had a terrific tone at the top, and that's really sort of brought us as business leaders together. Uh, I think seven, eight, nine years ago, there was very little conversation from the, between the East and the West. When you look at the city of Detroit, and Mayor, you did a great job yesterday, thanks for that. The collaboration between a Republican governor and a Democratic mayor, and look what it's done for the city of Detroit. But you can look at Lansing, you can look at Grand Rapids, you can go north and you can go south. That, um, uh, that tone at the top is contagious, and I think it's really, move the business community to work together with the leaders, and we have many great leaders, but the governor, I think, has set that tone, which has put this state in a great position seven years, almost seven years, uh, in his, into his governorship. So it is a great pleasure to introduce the governor of the great state of Michigan, Rick Snyder. Well, thanks, Dan, and I appreciate all the partnership. It's great to see Blue Cross's sponsorship of this wonderful conference. And again, I would reiterate a great thank you uh, to Sandy, to Stephen, to all the team here. It's wonderful to be back here for another year. Now, you've heard from me a lot already, so I'm glad to see someone still here. <laughs> um, we had the opportunity to talk at the welcome. I did a commission report. So I'm not going to talk about the commission reports again. What I thought I would do is actually take you on a journey through the pillars the pillars for this conference, um, because they're not separate things. We've talked about civility, winning through civility, the need to connect technology, and the need for improved economic opportunity. But they're all intertwined. And I thought it really sends a more powerful message when you understand these challenges go together. And we've done a lot to help address those challenges, but our work isn't done. And what are some of the next steps we need to do? So on the first day, I talked about the need for civility. And to be blunt, I made it clear that I view that as one of the greatest risks to our country, this lack of civility. We're a great country. You cannot maintain status as a great country if you can't be civil to one another. That's just common sense. When you stop and look at what are the causes of that or what's making that all happen, one of the features that's making it get amplified even more in my view is what we've seen through technology. The fact that we have a different media environment today. Back when we had three networks, 
you had a choice. ABC, CBS, NBC, and they were all within the same kind of range. You may not agree with them, but they were within a, a fairly balanced approach. Now what happens? And you know this, people tend to watch the station that's going to tell them what they want to hear. And so what you find is a repeat, an amplification that's not necessarily based on facts, but people are being pushed to continue to bring up the same issue over and over again and not hear there's another side to that topic in a civil way. That's one of the big problems we face. And ultimately, we have to make that personal decision. We're interested in other people's perspective. No one's making us do that. Many of us are making that choice. We have to have the courage and conviction to say, someone else may be right. And shouldn't we hear them out? So that's one big thing I would put on your plate to think about. But let me get to something that ties back into the pillars that's more than the amplification part, because I view this as something that's continuing that process, but what's at the causality of it? What's at the core in many respects? It gets back to economic opportunity, or the lack thereof. There are angry people out there. And why are they angry? You heard it from Darren Walker. If people lose hope, what are you left with? And a lot of people haven't lost hope, but they believe they've lost opportunity for a better life for themselves or for their kids, and that no one's listening to them. And traditionally, you can think of the urban areas where that's happened in many cases, but it's also happening in our rural areas. It can happen in any corner of our country where people before believed there was an opportunity for a better life, and people are not seeing that the same way anymore. So that first pillar, if it really needs to get solved, we need to work the second pillar about increasing economic opportunity. And let me talk about that in a few dimensions. For some time, we've been doing a lot of great things in sectors, in segments of this. And we should be proud of that. I'll give you illustrations. With our veterans, we've reached out to make sure they have economic opportunity. They've earned it. They put their lives on the line to protect us. We've done some great things, and I want to thank Richard Bernstein and the Lieutenant Governor for great work with their Hidden Talent Tour, helping people with disabilities find opportunity that they didn't have before. Um, Brenda Lawrence, I want to thank her comments on what we're doing in corrections. We're helping returning citizens have an opportunity to get skilled trades while they're still in and get job offers while they're still in a correctional institution. That's the right answer. So we're doing good things there. We're helping people with economic disadvantages in a number of cases with programs like Community Ventures. We've helped over 7,000 people get positions that they weren't traditionally able to hold work or have work. The average wage is over $12 an hour. That's a great start that can be built on. But that doesn't answer the biggest question that we're starting to face in our society in many respects. Back when many of us were young, we saw opportunity, we saw hope, because we were able to get a high school diploma. Many of us were fortunate enough to go off to college. But think back in those times, and I did this already today, I know the answer to this, but I always like to hear the reaction on a personal level is, think back when you were in high school and college and you were thinking about what you were doing for the living, and think about the fabulous counseling you got from your school. Do you remember that fabulous counseling? happens every time. People just start laughing. Right? We didn't get any advice. What we might get help with was filling out an application to a college. The people that made a difference in our lives were our parents or some mentor or someone else or someone we saw as a role model. That worked back then. That worked in the world of the 1960s, the world of the 1970s. It doesn't work well in the 21st century. And why is that? Because having that high school diploma is not the answer anymore. It's an entry point to say, how do I go get the next credential that shows I have a set of skills that's going to allow me to get connected into a well-paying career? There's a different ticket that we have to acquire. And one of the things I ask you to think about is, we shouldn't be calling it about getting a degree in some fashion, whether it be an associate's or bachelor's degree. We need to think more broadly. 
It's how to get that credential to show that we're now competent in some field. Because if you look at the issue today and you look at Michigan, the question is no longer, is there a job? We've got over 100,000 unfilled jobs in Michigan that are good, well-paying jobs. The issue is, how do you get the skills to take that role? So when you come back to that question to say, remember, we didn't get any help, we should be helping people now. We should be helping parents and young people understand where those opportunities are. There's a threshold set of several questions. This isn't an easy question to answer, but there's clearly two or three things we should be doing. We should be letting young people and parents know where those opportunities are, what quantity of positions there are, what's available in their area. If not in their area, where could they go? We should be letting them know what the probability of getting a job in that field is. How much would you make in that field? What's the required training? And what's the retraining you're gonna to need to be successful through that career? Because the first round isn't gonna do it for a whole career in this world anymore. We need to provide answers to those questions. One of the best ways to do it is, how do we engage the private sector more coming into the schools? One of the things I'd love to see is again, we've got good hardworking people. When I was talking about counselors, I wasn't trying to be derogatory. Their role and their focus has been helping people go to college. That's great. We don't want to discourage that. But how do we create an environment where we can also have people going in that have real sector depth knowledge, that do it for a living, and have it so young people can sit down with them, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or a group, and talk to them, and have them ask questions and have them learn from them. We're seeing success already with some great programs that we're doing outside the traditional education program. Programs like FIRST Robotics, Square One. These are awesome programs that are helping provide the answers to our young people today. In Michigan, we're a leader in doing that. We have more FIRST Robotics teams than any other state in this nation. We've done so well, they're bringing the world championships to Detroit for the next three years. But these young people have a focus now. I can guarantee you that if you've never been to one of those events, go to one, you're going to a rock concert for nerds. It's as exciting as any varsity athletic event. <laughs> they're rocking. And that's because they're excited. So one of the things we're gonna see in our educational system, in addition to trying to get more public-private partnerships, is the nature of education is transforming. You heard it from the Education Commission. It's going to be more about competency-based learning. And one format of that is more experiential learning. About, it's about getting experiences and seeing how those experiences influence you in a total fashion. A great illustration I'll give you, in addition to these wonderful programs like FIRST and Square One, we're looking to do it in computer science, is where do you think you can go find people smiling after doing Algebra two? How many people here think you can go find a group of people smiling about Algebra II in a high school easily? Anybody? I can raise my hand and tell you I can because I've seen it. You know where you go? You go to the carpentry class. You go to the welding class. You go to the pipe fitting class because they're learning Algebra II because we haven't lowered our standards and we shouldn't but we integrated those skill sets in those classes now. And you'll find those young people coming out to say, I'm proud, I just finished a roof design, I'm gonna build it, look at the gables on that roof and look at how I did the math to figure out how to do it right. Why don't we do that in so many more areas? That's the opportunity we have. We need to close that gap to make people career connected for economic opportunity and not just for them, for all of us. That's the kind of thought process we need to bring to the table. We're starting to do it, but let's accelerate it. First, square one, career tech education. Let's figure out how to mix these things up now. So it's not just about the textbook, it's about how do you turn the knowledge in that textbook from X, Y, and Z to something tangible, to something understandable, to something that's applied, 
that they can see value in and improving their lives. That's what we need to do in terms of economic opportunity, in terms of making these things work. And it's, again, not a solution just from that school. It's not just a solution from government. It's a community answer. It's all of us participating in the solution. How many people here are involved in, first, robotics in some fashion? Raise your hand. We got a few. Isn't it one of the coolest things you've had a chance to work on in terms of seeing young people excited and don't you feel fulfilled as a mentor and a role model when you get a chance to do something like that? It makes us better people in terms of who we are. Let's do it. So this whole notion of civility ties into increased economic opportunity. And we need to get through that checklist of tough questions about how do we solve that problem that we were able to ignore when we were young that now we need to answer, that now we need to show people multiple paths and then give them the flexibility to choose what path works best for them to choose something they care about. The place that does the best at that is going to have a competitive economic advantage over every other jurisdiction in this country and will help lead the world. We've got more of the elements in my view than anyone else in this country. But we haven't finished. We haven't packaged this up the way we need to. The pieces are there. We've got the puzzle pieces, but let's put the puzzle together. Together. Now beyond that, the third pillar, connected through technology. That's a positive opportunity largely that we can't overlook. And one, you've talked about it, we talk about mobility. Now the interesting part is I've watched people a lot because I've been talking about mobility for several years now. And the funny part is, is people seem to get excited, but to be open with you, I'm not sure a lot of people fully appreciate what mobility is. So let me spend a minute talking about what mobility means to me, because it mean, can mean something different to many people. But it's more than one thing about intelligent and connected vehicles. First of all, it's about safety. Most accidents are caused by human error. It's the distracted driver or anything else. We cause most of the accidents. That vehicle doesn't cause them. It can, but that's a small percentage. If we have more intelligent and autonomous vehicles, we're going to be safer. We're going to save lives. The second thing, though, it's back to opportunity again. If we have autonomous, intelligent vehicles working well, it opens up a whole new world for people with disabilities, back to hidden talents. It opens up a whole new world for our seniors in terms of ways to get to places that they may not have that mobility, that flexibility anymore. It opens up a whole new world to economically disadvantaged people because you can send individual vehicles instead of saying you have to wait for that bus to show up for 20 minutes or a half hour. It can transform things. And we should look at that transformation as a great opportunity. The other thing is, for many of us, we may not fall in those groups. It's going to free up our time. Because how many people in your vehicle at some point would admit you're a distracted driver because you're doing something you probably shouldn't because you don't have enough time in your life. How many would sign up for that one? Oh, we got a lot of people not being truthful here today. <laughs> Come on, guys. It would free up time, one of the most precious assets we always look forward to. So mobility is this huge opportunity that we can deliver on. So think of that not just as a word, not just as a business thing, but something that's going to improve our lives and our society. The second one is about connection, is what I said the other day. It's about broadband. It's a way to bring back our rural areas, to create opportunities. One of the things in the Economic Commission report, they talked about megacities being created, about how these huge cities are places where everyone's going. I actually don't fully buy into that. I think it is happening, but there's going to be a big pushback at some point in terms of the megacity concept because they get so mega, they don't work well. And if you had a choice between 
living in some huge skyscraper that you had, you go from one to the other in some monster city with people surrounding you all the time, or going out there on the lake shore and having a place to live, what are you going to choose? And the point is, people went to cities originally for economic opportunity because they had to because people work in concentrations. They had to get together to work together. Broadband, internet, connectivity makes that no longer required. It makes it so you can work anywhere, anytime. And so what we should be thinking of in Michigan, one of our greatest assets are natural resources. The shorelines, whether it be the Great Lakes or the 11,000 lakes. That's all a quality of life, place-making opportunity to have high value lifestyle and a great place to earn a living if you can utilize broadband appropriately. Let's make it happen. That's a choice that will grow our state, that will grow our population, that will create good things in terms of new business enterprises. I actually really enjoyed the mayor's presentation yesterday. He did a great job of giving history of Detroit. But when he got into showing how neighborhoods could come back and how you could get small businesses being created because of concentrations of people, this is that same concept. We can bring back many parts of our state that have been in decline for decades in terms of many counties, many of our rural areas, because you could work there. And that corner store will come back. That other enterprise will come back. Let's do those kind of things. Let's figure out how to optimize that in terms of exciting opportunities. We need to be doing it in Detroit. We need to be doing it in Alpena. We need to be doing it in Newberry. Let's do it. It's a great opportunity. So there are so many great things out there when you weave in this concept of being connected. We can learn from that. We can leverage that for, again, national and international leadership. So I've taken you through a journey of those first three. And I'll come back to the civility thing again. Think about it. Has anything I said today been really that much rocket science? No. I hope most of what I've just covered is pretty common sense. But the point is, is we don't have those dialogues enough to say, let's step back for a minute. We live busy lives and look at the big picture and say, are we making our life harder or easier? We've made it harder because we kept on asking the same question over and over again to say, as we go through school, we got to go see the college counselor. And that was good enough. We did the same thing in terms of saying, hey, we got to take algebra two. If you asked me to take algebra two today, I'd go sign up for the carpentry class. Seriously. But we kept on saying, you got to go take algebra two. How many of us didn't go into engineering or some field like that because we didn't like X, Y, and Z? That if you would have had a chance to apply it, you might have made a whole different career choice. And then how do you look at it and say, we need to ask new questions. We need to redefine the question from what we always said before. And by answering the new question, it's not hard to answer. It's actually a good question to answer. Then how do you do it? And that's my appeal to you. And that's back to civility. It's not something I'm going to decide. Hopefully, you see, I'm absolutely passionate about these topics. I love this stuff. I, I believe in it. I am, to my core, focused on doing it through December 31st, 2018, to make it happen for every Michigander. But it's not just me. My question to you, are you ready to sign up to change the questions we've been asking? When you keep on asking the same question over and over again, that's an indication of insanity. Let's get to common sense. Let's start asking these new smart questions. Again, this isn't rocket science. And then let's get them done. And that's a theme you've heard this whole conference. And that's a message we should be carrying out of here as action items. So I thank you for your cooperation, your collaboration, your excitement. But go out of here with some passion to say, I'm going to go answer that question, and I'm going to get it done in my community and all of Michigan. Thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome political reporter for WOOD TV, Rick Elbin. Rick. Good. Good afternoon. It is nice to be here with you. I, you'll indulge me just one moment. I need to tell this story. Last year, I was sitting in this chair, and the lieutenant governor, who has only a few fewer followers on Twitter than President Trump, decided that the governor and I, both dressed in our navy jackets and light blue shirts and dark pants and our gray hair, looked similar. <laughs> so he took the picture, and immediately people at my station started posting, who wore it better? So for a year, for a year, I've worried about that. So I told the governor, I told the first lady this morning, I went to the store and I specifically went to the store and I bought shirts that I was sure Rick Snyder would never wear. <laughs> and so last night we were on the porch doing a live interview and I said, Governor, I, I went and bought these shirts that you would never wear. I said, look at this. And he goes, yeah, you're right, I'd never wear them. <laughs> um, it's always a pleasure to do this. Thanks. Uh, how about a nice round of applause for the chamber for an excellent event. Uh, Every, every now, are you going to finish the story, though? Well, what, what, oh, well I, I can finish the story. When I walked backstage uh, today, he was sitting with the lanyard like you're all wearing, and it said Rick Albin, Wood TV, media. <laughs> I'm not sure how he got that. Anyway. And connections. Yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> Hey, let's talk about some of these things because we, we want to keep uh, this on time. You just talked about some very positive things looking forward. There's some really concrete things, though, that I know that you're still working on. One of those is tomorrow. You're going to go take a look at the Sioux Locks, and that's part of a large infrastructure project uh, that could be forthcoming. We would assume a lot of that would be federal money. But infrastructure in general is still something high on your priority list. Where are we and what should the state be doing or, or what can all of us be doing in, in that in that vein. Yeah, it absolutely is, Rick. And that's why it was great to have uh, the earlier session and Evan Weiner talking about the Infrastructure Commission report. Um, we need to roadmap things. We need to set a long-term roadmap for the next 40, 50 years and come up with a real plan. And we've already started implementing that with integrated asset management. And we've got a pilot going between Detroit and Grand Rapids areas to say, how can we be smarter about not digging up that road four times, one for roads itself, one for water and sewer, one for you know, electric utilities, and one for broadband. Let's do it once. Mm -hmm. So we've already started that process. And when you come to the Sioux Locks, the great part is, I believe we've got great bipartisan support. Uh, there was a great panel of congressional people. Uh, we're doing a tour tomorrow to go up to the Sioux. Um, because from a national infrastructure point of view, it is cri critical for the national security of this country to get another 1,000-foot lock built. If that current lock went down for a shipping season, and it, all it would take is one major incident, it would be down. Literally, it would lead to millions of unemployed people in this country. We wouldn't be able to build a car because the steel wouldn't be there. Appliances would be at risk. This would be disastrous. And this canal, the second lock, was authorized by Congress back in the 1980s. I mean, let's get the resources to get it built. Not only that, we would address the risk piece, it would create new economic opportunity for Michigan. Not just the building, but having a second option. So it's really important. And I really ask you, give positive reinforcement to your congressional delegation for working well together and ask them to speak up. And this is a bipartisan tour tomorrow that should yeah. be going on uh, with Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate. It was authorized but the appropriation was never made. Let's talk about some appropriations yeah. here in the state. So we all know this is budget time. Yeah. And for six years in a row, you have worked with the legislature to get the budget done by about this time or in the next couple of weeks this year. The budgets are there. They're not finished quite yet, but I'm told that some of them could be. But there is another component that has to do with employee retirement, teacher and public works employment. Try to put that in perspective for those of us who watch and wonder what the connection what those two being connected is going to be for the budget process. Yeah, first of all, I'm not sure the connection is the best answer in terms of looking at, but the, the real question, and this gets very complicated, is it's about primarily about the school employee retirement system that's managed by the state. And the issue is, is people forget, we made huge reforms and did huge improvements back in 2012. Um, but there are still some areas that could be improved. And when I say improved, we could reduce some taxpayer risk, we could actually help make stronger assurances that those benefits will be there for the people. 
And then the question is, can we do that at some reasonable cost or as low a cost as possible? Um, one of the things that philosophically my partners in the legislature, at least a number of them feel strongly about, is they want to close the hybrid plan we put in place um, back in 2012. The hybrid plan is fully funded. It has a very conservative interest rate. They want to close it and do a larger defined contribution plan. So that's the only option. Um, two things that come out of that. One is it's just more expensive, period. Um, forget about accounting and transition costs. It would just cost more by billions and billions of dollars. The second piece is, is there's huge transition costs, and that gets into a lot of accounting. I'll skip that part. But that needs to be paid. And the question is, where does all that money come from? And that's the question I've asked. Um, because our budget this year tends to have more one-time money available. So it's like savings account money. It's not about like paycheck money. And we're talking having to find hundreds of millions of dollars of additional paycheck kind of money. Um, for the next several years, we're making a huge investment in roads, some tax relief, other things. I'm not sure where it comes from without major cuts in a lot of other programs. And that's the question I've said is, is you, where are you finding this from? And I always want to have the dialogue. The other thing I can say, though, is there are some risk out there. There's investment risk. There's mortality risk. You can see this is really exciting stuff. Um, but there are risks out there that could be solved through other measures, through other improvements. And I presented a list of a whole bunch of those ideas to say, why don't we go do a whole bunch of these that I think we can get mighty close to your same concept of how do we get less risk in the system at a lower cost and something that's still a good benefit and another choice to the employees. Um, they don't agree with me. Um, they're a separate branch of government. I respect them. And I just hope we can work through this, because not getting a budget done by the end of June is not just about hitting a phrase. Our municipalities, our school districts are on a different fiscal year than we are. Their fiscal year starts July 1. We're leaving them hanging in uncertainty as to what state resources they're going to get. Anybody here would like to do your budget not knowing what your paycheck's going to look like for the first three months of your year? I don't think it's a good answer. So that's where I've always been encouraged, and that's why I sort of set the June date when I started this you know, several years ago, because it provides a lot better certainty for our partners. And I view our cities and our schools as my partner. So I hope we can work through this. I would really encourage my partners to sit down and let's hash through it. Let's get some good answers. This is RPA, folks, Relentless Positive Action. Here's a problem. Here's some solutions. Let's get them on the table. Let's get them voted in, and let's keep going. I don't want to belabor this. Is the budget done by the end of June? I hope so. It's challenging. It's, we're starting to run out of time to get that to happen. It could get passed. But one of the things you have to recognize when you have a $50 billion budget is even when you pass the budget, it takes some time to do the processing. It's not quite just passing another bill in terms of the work that goes into it. You talked about some one-time money uh, in a budget. I always think of one-time money in Lansing as money that just hasn't been spent yet. And in this case, I've talked to a number of people, including you, about what some of that money could be used for. And it was your budget director who suggested that he, at least, would like to have seen some of that money put aside for some of those coming payments for the roads deal that you referenced yeah. uh, coming forward, because as you point out, some of that money may be hard to come by. How confident are you understanding that you're not going to be in office, the legislators who dealt with the uh, plan largely are not going, at least not going to be in the House, some of them may be over in the Senate, aren't going to be there. How confident are you that when it comes time to pay that bill, there'll be $1.2 billion, or more important, the $600 million out of the general fund? I believe it should be there and will be there. Again, that's where I've stayed focused to say, this is our plan. We agreed to it. Let's follow through. I mean, that's part of what we should be expecting out of our public servants, right? That's the benchmark I said when I was running for office in 2009. Two criteria. D did I do what I said I was going to do? And hey, I said I was going to get $1.2 billion. So from my side, there's no question that's the right thing to do. Um, the other one was, is did we good, build a stronger foundation for long-term success? And having that $1.2 billion is a starting payment on that $4 billion number you heard in the infrastructure report. That's making a difference. Again, you don't do it all overnight, but that's a good down payment. So with respect to that one-time money, what I originally did in my budget proposal is say, let's do two things with it. One, let's add to our rainy day fund. It's not as high as it should be. We should be really proud. It was $2 million when I took office. 
It's 700 and some million a day. It should be north of a billion dollars. So it's just like that emergency savings account that most of us have for so many months. Um, it's not to the balance that would be prudent at this point. So wouldn't it be prudent to put something towards it? The other one is, as I said, let's put some one-time money in an infrastructure account that could be seed money. Again, if it's one-time money, it's not going to be that big $4 billion number. But I use it as a great illustration of, I'll use the Fraser sinkhole kind of challenge. Because again, they're paying for that, but could we help communities that are willing to do more investigation of what their situation is, monitoring, you know, checking out for long-term problems, and help kind of prime the pump on that, get that kick-started in terms of doing that by doing some matching programs or other creative programs? I think that would be helpful to get the infrastructure discussion going on a thoughtful way. Shift gears a little bit because there's been a lot of conversation and just a couple of hours ago we were out on the porch and you were part of an announcement about big jobs, good jobs yeah. for Michigan. Uh, there are two separate issues uh, about talent in Michigan. One is finding more jobs and in that particular case you're talking about larger industry that could create hundreds if not thousands of jobs. You can talk a little bit about that. But also finding the talent to fill the jobs that we have right now, which is considerable. And I know that you've talked about that too with your skilled trades uh, education. The question that came to mind as I was talking about this, we've discussed it uh, a lot of times. How quickly do you have to get that all geared up? Because there are jobs open right now and you can't train you can't train me to be a welder in a week. So obviously there is some lag time, but are we getting closer? Are we making progress on some of those? Yeah, we're, we're, we're making good progress, but I want to go faster because the sooner we can close that gap, there's great economic opportunity for citizens to have a great career, and it feeds on itself to make us that center place, that centerpiece of overall economic development. And so it's about being more creative and thoughtful about this. And so we're actually coming up with some good ideas. I hope to potentially get some of these announced through the summertime about some reforms to how we do career tech education and how do we look at some of these things. I'll give you an illustration. I went to a career tech center in Metro Detroit, and it was awesome. That's where I found one of those Algebra two classes too, by the way, these guys smiling. So I was walking through and they said, let us show you the HVAC room heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Another great trade, a professional trade. So I go in the room, it's dark. They couldn't find an instructor because the demand's so high. They couldn't get somebody to come teach the course. So I said, this is crazy. So I said, is there a way? We should be figuring out how to sit down with the HVAC contractors, the people in the area, to say, do you understand how bad this answer is? And even though you're starved on jobs, isn't there some way you can free up one of your best people or even a combination of them to say they should be coming in and we should find the right certifications or way to help give them oversight from regular teachers, but we can get them doing that class? Because the worst answer in the world is, is they're 100% booked, but the solution to help them get more talent so they can do even more business, that room's empty. And again, that's going back to public-private partnerships. That's not government solutions. That's Good common sense. You're talking to people. Governor, we could do this for another half hour, but Sandy would throw me off the stage. We are completely out of time. Thank you for your time for doing this. Thanks to the chamber, and thanks very much for having me here. Thank you.